Um, so shell accounts are another way of doing this. This is basically when you log into a Linux server and you see a bash prompt. If you can get to that bash prompt, you can then start doing things on, on that remote computer as if you were your own. There are um, two um, text browsers. One is called Lynx, one is called eLynx. I'm not familiar with eLynx, but eLynx is a more up-to-date version of Lynx, and I'll be probably integrating that into the next version of the course. But Lynx is the older non-JavaScript uh, version of, uh, of a, of a text-based web browser, and we'll be, we'll be using that as well. Um, so freeshell.org is the longest, best, and free uh, shell provider. It's, well, technically they want you to provide $1 to prove you're not a spammer because they were having spamming issues at one point, and if you send them $1, they're like, hey, you, you, the effort it takes to send $1 is probably going to be a spammer. Hello. Question? Uh, it's a $35 membership one time allows you to have a lot greater amount of tools than just a, the, the free version of the account. And if you provide $35 per year, you get to have cron jobs and all that other stuff that would, would come really handy. They're, the only caveat that I'll throw in there is that their disk hardware is not the best and it's been failing a little bit more often than not, so that's the one caveat I'll throw on there. Is that their reliability has not been their reliability hasn't been super great, but it's it's a way of getting a free account that's not too bad uh, for playing around. Um, web hosters allow you to create account, create uh, shell accounts. Um, Slice host is one for two hundred forty dollars a year, and Pair is one for seventy one dollars a year. But that sort of is. Uh, you can find cheaper ones depending on what package you end up using, and it's just a way of creating a shell account. Um, uh, your home PC can be a shell uh, account too if you're at work or something like that, and you just need to web boot, browse the web uh, and not have your web uh, stuff be uh, looked at through MITRE, um, and that's one way of doing it. Um, uh, cloud providers such as Amazon also allow you to search the web um, or allow you to have uh, shells on their account. Um, they also provide remote desktop support if you're willing to do that additional network connectivity. Uh, and I don't know if you want to do that network connectivity, but if you can uh, uh, sustain the, the baud rates to do that. Does that make sense? Using myself. So it was just confusing myself there as I said that. But yeah, the, uh, Amazon, so Amazon's cloud allows you to have virtual servers of which you, which at that point you can get a prompt uh, where, where you can have a shell prompt. Uh, so instead of um, you relying on, on an infrastructure to do that for you, it's really more the Amazon providing you the infrastructure and you have to administer the bots yourself. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Does that sound reasonable? Um, so Amazon EC2 is is a way of creating your own virtual server within the Amazon. Well, is it, you're creating a virtual server, server within the Amazon cloud, which is the Amazon controlled instances. Um, it's a great way to obfuscate where you're coming from because instead of your network activity coming from uh, MITRE would be coming from somewhere in the Amazon cloud. Uh, it does cost money. It does require a credit card. It does require a valid phone number. And if you do enough bad stuff such as WikiLeaks, they will shut you down. But as long as you don't do enough bad stuff, you should be fine. Um, it is sort of a pain to create an account. It's sort of expensive, and it's hard to know exactly what is costing you money. So it's something that um, you have to sort of experience before you will actually know how much it will cost you. 
um, for I have a very small server, which is like an eight uh, eight gigabyte server with the minimal configuration. It's costing me three bucks last month to run for the entire month. So it wasn't too expensive, but it was. But but there's but that's the type of stuff that you're dealing with with a super minimal server. With the more expensive servers, it's like three to four dollars per hour to run. So those charges can really add up. And it's, but for minimal browsing usage, which is what we're talking about here, you can get away with that really minimal charge. So. Eight gigs of disk space, that's correct. You, well, it's actually volatile storage because everything is actually on a RAM disk. So what you can do is you can create snapshots where they actually store it to tape but um, for a particular server, but, but that's another way that they cost you a little bit of money. Possibly. I don't know. I know they are for billing purposes, but I'm not sure what they're doing behind beyond that. Yeah, it, it, it's really sort of boils down to how much do you trust Amazon to do what they're saying to do, and that's an open question. The other thing too is that because they have servers in multiple countries, I'm not sure what the individual countries that are hosting the data are doing doing with it as well. Uh, it also becomes actually a, a issue with PII because each country have, has different PII rules as well. So that's it, it's a it, it could be. Once you start going down the legal side of things, I'm not really sure. It would probably be best to talk with a lawyer and or Amazon lawyers to figure out exactly what's happening there. Yeah, because basically I'm saying I know that I do not know the appropriate answer. Um, so I'm going to talk more about cost here for a second. There are spot instances on the micro, on the Amazon cloud, which is basically if if Amazon has extra processing power available, uh, they will allow you to run a uh, virtual box on their a uh, virtual box. They will allow you to run a virtual machine on, on their space for cheaper than it would be for their standard price. The only issue is is that it takes a while, where a while is a couple of about five minutes or so for the machine to start. So that's the one downside with the, with the spot instances. If you go to the regular pricing, pricing it costs uh, a little bit more for you to actually run the instance. Uh, so it's really, you just have to do a cost uh, comparison there. Um, the other thing is, is that your service is not guaranteed to run. If their uh, server, if their uh, capacity gets to a certain point, they'll just shut down your machine if you haven't bid a high enough price for your machine to run, which is a little weird, but it's cheaper than their standard pricing. Um, yeah. Okay. So they do have. Including California, Oregon, Virginia, Ireland, Singapore, da 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 da. So the question we have is, where do you want to browse from today? Um, does anyone have a particular country of interest that they would like to have a web browser when they come back from lunch? I've never. I'm interested in doing the one from Sydney. So we'll have a web browser in Sydney when we come back. Um, and we'll be doing that within the, yeah, and we'll, and we'll do that one come back. Uh, this is the Google News page for Australia. Uh, you can see that we have the Australian as the two top uh, URLs here. Uh, if we go to Zach.freeshell.org slash env. And we'll wait for the screen to refresh, which does take, take a second or two. 
because we are sending a bunch of display requests to Australia and back. Um, our re remote IP address is 54. We're looking from AP southeast2.amazon.com, which corresponds to Australia. It's not a Tor exit node. And once we scroll down to the bottom of the page here, if we scroll down to the bottom of the page here, that's the price you have to pay. Yeah. Oh, but Maxmine, thanks for in Australia. Hostip.info and GOIP free, thanks for in the United States because it's all associated with Amazon. So, yeah, it's. It, it's one of those things where it's very cool, but it's also expensive at the same time. Um, what I'm going to do is log out of the server. Go to my EC2 settings. And in Sydney, I have one running instance. And I and include in the documents folder all these individual things. Right click on the instance and terminate the instance. Are you sure you want to terminate the instance? Because you can't restart it after you terminate it. Yes. That also means that it will stop billing me for that instance, which is also a good thing. Now the instance is shutting down and then was terminated, it's, it's gone away. So that's sort of how you how you do uh, Amazon EC2 type stuff. You can you can do it, it's a little bit complicated to get going, but it does work. <coughs> It typically, Amazon, the, the cloud is used for um, web hosting or for Tomcat or for email or for content delivery network, that type of stuff. It's generally not used for web browsing. So it, it wouldn't necessarily raise a flag that you're being used for, for web browsing because what uh, Amazon, uh, one of the Amazon new tablets actually makes requests to various web servers to optimize the performance of the website. So that could be, it actually may not be that strange to see a optimization being performed from whatever uh, place you're interested in. Um, if I was looking at the logs, no. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it might be slightly suspicious, but it, but it probably wouldn't raise any eyebrows because a lot of people you are using Amazon to do weird things. Um, I really don't. So for the most part, you probably don't have anything to worry about. So, uh, like, it's one of those things that, to be on the safe side, you want may want to send them an email to say say what type of stuff you actually do here. But I don't think they're doing anything. Um, they do allow you to clone instances of the machine. They do allow you to run Windows. Um, they allow you to do live backups, which is also interesting. So you can have the OS running and do a backup at the same time. So <coughs> there's some magic there. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it can be done. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Lynx, which is another text browser. It's basically a text-based web browser. So if you, and the reason why we're going to be looking at this now is because of the fact that we're going to have a lab in a little bit where we're going to be 
logging into an Amazon instance and looking at the, that environment versus under a Torified environment. And you, you can, so it's, it's good to see that you can be here, but actually be in two different places at once. Um, so Blink is, is, is not the most easiest web browser to use, but it's not too bad. Um, the one complaint that I had from last time was that, was that the people that are sort of on the colorblind spectrum um, can't easily use uh, this, which is unfortunately true. Uh, but that's a known issue. I'll just stand up. Um, the way that you use links, and we, we are, we'll be doing this in the lab here for, in a second, is to type links at the command line with the URL you want to go to. Um, then use the up and down arrows to browse around within the web page. And then uh, type G to go to another website and press the return to follow URL. And it's a little bit cumbersome, but it does work. Um, if you look in the bottom left-hand section of the page, it's sort of like a of the screen is sort of like a status indicator as to what you can do, what actions you can perform with the current selected item. So like if it's a link, you can follow the link. If it's a text area, it will tell you they can type in text there. Um, okay, so if you want to actually browse another web server from another host, um, you need to make sure that you have X installed and then you can use SSH-Y user at remote, remote host and you can have a web browser via um, using the X protocol at that remote host, which is what I did for, for the host server in Australia. <coughs> um, there's um, you can also use VNC or another remote desktop protocol of your choice. That may, you'll probably have different network characteristics depending on which one you ended up using. Um, now, the reason why I chose X for the, for the example was because it actually worked as compared to VNC, which I was having issues with earlier, and I'm not really sure why. So this is an interesting website. It's a one-off page viewer, um, which basically is if you want to have a browse a web page from a machine other than your own, you can go to controlq.org slash screenshots and we'll grab a screenshot of a remote website as if you were coming from the controlq.org's um, web, uh, web server. So that's actually hosted on a DreamHost virtual machine. So that's one way of obfuscating where you're coming from, but everything still will go through your normal internet connection. It's just that's a way of getting a snapshot in time of a particular website. That's right. If we were to go here, and normally, torproject.org is the Tor uh, proxy server, the pr proxy service, which is normally blocked by MITRE's firewall. Because controlq.org is not blocked by MITRE's firewall, we can have a screen capture of that, we, and then we can look at the image of what what is, what is there. Now, you're not actually clicking, on, you're not able to click on any of the links that are presented on this web page. You can only just look at it. But that's, that's just something to be aware of, that something like this exists. Mm -hmm.